والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم Allah knows what's best for us So why should we complain We always want the sunshine But he knows there must be rain We always want the laughter And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits wrong Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to Inspirations All praises due to Allah, we praise Him, we seek His aid and we ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evils of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped, except Allah alone who has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations as we will try as usual inshallah uh, and we will strive to spend some time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. We will try to travel through time. We will try to visualize the things as they happened at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to try to get personally involved in those events in order to make it into a personal experience so that we benefit as much as possible from the lessons that are found in such events and uh, such circumstances. And we will try to learn from the wisdom of the Prophet wasallam and the good example of his companions. Uh, we are still in the, somehow, not in the middle of the battle, but, but towards the end of it, seeing the down... Uh, hill, a course of events, how things went wrong after the Muslims actually had won the battle, one mistake, making light of the injunctions or the directions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, taking not taking them seriously, not taking them to the letter, trying to outwit outwit the instructions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Assuming that we understand the spirit behind these instructions, we understand the general wisdom, we don't have to stick to the letter. No, we know the wisdom, so we can take another route as long as we arrive at the same goal. That led to the Muslims losing their, their battle, the wonderful victory they've had achieved at the beginning. So maybe we should be able, and hopefully we will understand this lesson and we will implement it in our lives so we don't take lightly the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. No, we put it in the position that it really deserves to be in. We appreciate it. And we try to follow it in everything we can. By this we can be better Muslims. And we will be strengthening our ummah. And we will be uh, paving the way for the ummah to grow and prosper and assume its position that Allah has given it, the position of leadership of humanity. As many questions have come to us, uh, how, what should we do in these times when Muslims are being humiliated in different parts around the world? The ongoing dilemma of Palestine, of Iraq, Afghanistan, Chechnya, the Muslims in India, in Kashmir, all different parts around the world, even now in Europe. So many things are happening. So many legislations have been passed. And they actually, and I believe if we remain as we are, there will be more legislations stipulated against the Muslims. What can we do? And I said previously that most people like to, de to deal with what is urgent. But sometimes we deal with urgent matters 
inefficiently because we are not in a position to deal with them. Like the issue of Palestine. Many people get so much agitated when a massacre takes place in Palestine. And this has been an ongoing thing. Every couple of years there's a great massacre. A huge, I'm talking about huge, large-scale massacres. They take place. We get agitated, we get frustrated, we express our anger. And then what? Actually, we don't achieve anything practical. We haven't become stronger in our religion. And we haven't paved the way to empower the ummah and strengthen it. All what we have done, we've just expressed our anger. We like to deal with it urgently on an urgent basis. And then what? We don't do anything. Sometimes, you know, the deep problems, the uh, problems that have deep roots, they cannot be dealt with urgently. And urgent measures basically have very little impact on deep problems. Because deep problems have to be dealt with from the roots. And when you deal with the roots, somehow what you are doing now to m many people seems irrelevant. Many times when, when the scholars of Islam say to the Muslim public, we have to learn our religion and study it so that we can implement it. We have to study our religion in a way that will help us, empower us to practice Islam in every detail of our lives. And empower Islam in our lives. So that we can be real Muslims in all the aspects, all the major roles in our lives. If you are a professional in your profession, at home as a husband, as a father, as a brother, as a son, as a daughter, as a sister. In all our roles, we have to be role models, real Muslims. And when we do that, things will change. But many times when the scholars tell the people, we have to, this is what we have to start with. People say that's irrelevant. Muslims are being killed all around the world and you are talking about seeking knowledge? That's ridiculous. Wallahi, we hear that so many times. But that's because many people have a shallow understanding, have very uh, superficial understanding. Deep problems cannot be solved with urgent measures. There, are, there might be some exceptions, but generally, generally speaking, deep pro problems will not or cannot be solved on an on urgent basis. Never. Ur deep problems need a deep approach. And as I said, the early steps of a deep approach, most of the time, seem to be irrelevant. But actually, they are the most important. We have a problem, we have a real disease in the Muslim world. We actually, we are lagging somewhere with urgent matters, even if they are not important. Urgent, emotional reactions, this is where we are stuck and we cannot get out of that. And as I said, a sense of urgency does not solve deep problems at all. You need a deep insight. You need a full strategy to deal with deep problems. You need a deep strategy. And as I said, all the t most of the time, the early stages of any deep strategy will seem irrelevant, except for people who have a very deep insight into things, people who have good sense of intuition, people who have a holistic understanding of what the problem is. And these are the scholars. So when the scholars tell us, we have to learn our religion, we have to implement it. Actually, there have been for about 100 years, groups among the Muslims, when you say, they have been always saying to the scholars, you are talking about knowledge and about implementing this knowledge when the Muslims are, when the Khilafah has been taken away, when the Muslims are being killed, when the Muslims have been subjugated, when the Muslims have been colonized. Yes, that was their attitude about 100 years ago or maybe just a bit less. Now we have to deal with these issues of the Muslims, with the state of the Muslims urgently. They've been dealing urgently for about 80, 100, 80 or 100 years now. And what have they achieved? Nothing. They live, they're just so reactive. It's a short-term thing. The sense of urgency is false. What really changes nations' direction is deep... Subtle, confident, slow, ground, 
all sweeping change and methodologies. This is what changes. And most of these, the work at the roots mainly seems irrelevant. So this is something that we have to understand. This is one of the natural laws that govern this world. Deep problems, you need to deal with them at the root level. If we remain dealing with the situation of the Muslims today on a superficial level, we will not be able to fix it. And we will lag where we are now or even worse. Just try to, let's try to give some kind of analogy. Say you have some kind of a tree that gives very good, fruit, uh, very good fruits. Then there is an illness that affects the roots. So this is why the fruits are not very good. It doesn't give good fruits anymore. And the leaves look very pale and yellowish. So the tree lost its beauty and its ability to give uh, good produce or good production. A superficial understanding, as unfortunately most of us have today, would say, okay, come, let's see, let's check the leaves, provide them with some nutrition, provide them with some kind of medicine, and the fruits, we will try to give hormones to this tree, so it gives the fruits get bigger and nicer and better. Still the tree, you might be able to achieve a very limited imp uh, improvement, very limited kind of progress in the quality of the leaves and the fruits, but the problem is still there. Someone of a good understanding will say, no, we have to deal with the roots. Those people with shallow understanding, we have to dig down, find out what's wrong with the roots, and then provide the medicine to the roots so we can fix the roots. Then the tree will go back to its uh, well-being. It will give good fruits and the leaves will, the, the tree will look good as well. People with shallow understanding will say, we're talking about the leaves and we're talking about the fruits. You're talking about the roots? That's stupid. This is what most of us do today when the scholars tell us. You can't deal. The, actually, the problem the Muslims are in is of a large scale to the extent that urgent actions cannot solve the problem. They might solve one part of the problem or one symptom of the illness. They might be able to subdue it, to subdue the, uh, the symptom, but they will never deal with the illness, they will never treat it. A person with a good insight, a person with a holistic understanding, a person who has real knowledge of the tree, will tell you, dig down. Here is the medicine. You treat the roots, and slowly the tree will be healed, and you, will have, you don't have to treat the, root, the fruits and the leaves. This is some kind of an analogy, hopefully will help us understand the situation of the Muslims uh, today. Uh, so, uh, basically, the, these are some of the, thing, some of the uh, lessons that we can learn from the consequences of the Battle of, of Uhud. Today we will mention some interesting stories. We will actually talk about the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to the Prophet ﷺ when the Prophet ﷺ made a remark about Allah being angry with people who deal with their Prophet in such a way. Also we will talk about a martyr, a martyr, imagine a shaheed who walks on earth, imagine a shaheed, yet he still walks on earth. And we will talk about one hero, one, one of the strongest fighters in the Muslim army, yet he will be in the hellfire. Then we will talk about the end towards the end of the Battle of Badr, how Abu Sufyan was so arrogant. These are some of the things that we will talk about. Some of them are very interesting story, and very inspiring, uh, beautiful examples from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We said last time that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said after they, the companions gathered around him and they started mounting Mount Uhud and they got a bit higher from the level ground and they felt a bit secure, more secure than they were in the battlefield. The Prophet ﷺ, after suffering from all these pains and these wounds, he said Allah is angry with people, with the people who do that to their Prophet when he was trying to show them the truth. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to the, responded to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ أَوْ يَتُوبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَوْ يُعَذِّبَهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ Allah says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's not to you, it's not up to you to judge about these people, to judge these people. It's all back to Allah, it's all down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever He wants to do, He does. If Allah wants to punish them, He will punish them. If Allah wants to be pleased with them, guide them and then be pleased with them, then Allah will do that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was just teaching the Prophet sallallahu don't make absolute judgments about those people. All what you have to do, just convey the message and bear patiently all the, uh, the hardships and all the uh, sacrifice that you have to give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu had a very wonderful, big heart, full with mercy for people. As soon as he received that verse, the Prophet sallallahu said, Allahumma ghfir li qawmi. Oh Allah, forgive my people because they don't really know the truth. Imagine how wonderful that person is. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is our Prophet that we are proud of. We're happy to be his followers. We, have, we are happy to be the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, we are so happy to follow you, O Messenger of Allah. Imagine at that time they've cut his head and they've cut his cheek and one, the sharp side of his helmet went into his cheek. They broke his, one of his teeth and the Prophet was feeling so tired that when he walked he fell on his knees because of the thirst. Yet after all of this, because he wasn't trying to avenge himself when he said that statement, when he said Allah is angry with people, how can Allah be pleased with the, people, with the people who do that to their Prophet when he was trying to show them the truth? The Prophet ﷺ actually was feeling uh, frustrated about these people. Why did they do that? Why, do they, why are they so arrogant in the face of the truth? But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that verse to him, the Prophet ﷺ, Allah forgive my people. They don't really know the truth. They don't really know what they are doing. That's our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and that's the example we want to follow. Some of the people in the field of da'wah, as soon as somebody speaks bad about them, or somebody spreads a rumor about them, or someone att attacks them, they just give up. Oh, I don't want to get myself in all that trouble. And they give up their efforts in da'wah. That's not the example of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inshallah, we will talk about the martyr who was walking on earth, the walking martyr. We'll talk about that after the short break. Stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Earth, the human heart, greed, exploitation, hatred. All diseases of the heart. For the cure, join Huda TV every Sunday at 20 GMT for Moments for the Heart. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. We are still trying to live and relive the times just after the battle of, Bat of, of Uhud, just after the tragedy the Muslims had after the battle or towards the end of the battle of Uhud, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We just talked about the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how wonderful his heart was, how loving, how pitiful, how compassionate his heart was, even caring for his own enemies when they hit him, uh, when they hurt him and when they cut him. He was still merciful towards them, hoping that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala would guide them and forgive their sins. Surprisingly, there was one martyr who still remained alive, but yet still was a martyr. 
one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, Rafi' ibn Khudayj Rafi' ibn Khudayj was one of Al-Ansar in the battle he was hit with an arrow an arrow came and landed on his chest actually it penetrated his chest and the pointed part the sharp part of the arrow was inside his lung but he yet he was still alive so he came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam complaining about his wound and about that arrow he was asking the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to pull it out the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him listen i can pull the whole thing out and you will be healed but you have another choice it's another offer that i can pull the arrow and keep that sharp side inside inside your chest inside your lung and i will be witness for you on the day of judgment that you are a martyr you're a shaheed he said o messenger of allah i'll take the second choice i want to be a martyr so the prophet sallam pulled the arrow and he left that sharp or that pointed uh, head of the arrow inside his chest so he lived for the rest of his life with that with that piece with the head of the arrow inside his lung and inside his chest and the prophet sallam will bear witness on the day of judgment for that person that he is a martyr one of the martyrs of the battle of uhud so imagine one of the martyrs of the battle of uhud was still alive walking on earth rafi' ibn khudayj this great companion and we see that imagine at that time imagine the pain of a person having an arrow inside his chest inside his lung imagine the pain yet when he heard about martyrdom he put up with that pain he endured that pain just to get that wonderful privilege of being a martyr yet he was still alive walking among people walking among humans and among the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at that very moment surprisingly the companions felt sleepy they started to fall asleep at that critical moment after all these wounds and this uh, great tragedy the companions were feeling sleepy drowsy and actually they were falling asleep and that was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Zubair ibn al-Awwam he himself says we were with the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and at the time when we had the highest level of fear when we almost lost it there was none of us except that his chin was on his chest what does that mean actually they couldn't hold themselves they were falling asleep that their heads were falling and their chins were touching their chests they were falling asleep they were feeling drowsy and they fell asleep why was that a gift from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the muslims back to a better state better psychological state where they got rid of fear and uh, as zubair ibn awam says and i it was like dreaming it was like dreaming and i overheard someone saying لو كان لنا من الأمر شيء ما قتلناها هنا. One of the hypocrites who remained with the Muslims. His name was Mutib ibn Qushayr. Mutib ibn Qushayr was one of the hypocrites who remained with the Muslim army. When the Muslims were feeling drowsy and they were falling asleep, Mutib ibn Qushayr was not falling asleep because he was one of the hypocrites. Because that was a gift that Allah gave only to the true believers. So what was was Mut'ib ibn Qushayr saying? He was saying, لَوْ كَانَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ مَا قُتِلْنَا هَا هُنَا Had we really had choice, whether to fight or not, we wouldn't have been here, but Muhammad forced us. This, is what he wa- this was the gist of his message. Muhammad forced us to come here and be killed. Had we had choice, we wouldn't have been here. We, w- we wouldn't have been killed and murdered here. He was complaining. Now Zubair ibn al-Awwam said, I was between sleep, I was half awake, half asleep, and I overheard him saying that. I kept that in my mind. And after the battle of Uhud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses in Surah Ali Imran, which is obviously Surah number 3, the verse is number 154. Uh, you can, and I would advise you to go back and check it. It's very beautiful. As you have... As we are studying the story of the Battle of Uhud, when you go and read the story, the story from Surah Ali Imran, Surah number three, 
so many th- things will be revealed from the way you understand the verses. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in, in uh, verse number 154 of the surah, Surah Ali Imran, surah number 3, chapter number 3, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Allah has given you, has sent down a favor upon you after that tragedy. Allah sent down a gift to you which is sleep, uh, uh, drowsiness. Uh, Allah sent that down only to one group of you, the true believers. And there's another group from among the Muslim camp. They were mainly concerned about themselves, about their own safety. They weren't concerned about Islam or about the Prophet ﷺ. These were the hypocrites. They develop bad thoughts about Allah, wrong thoughts about Allah. They have bad suspicion about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Su'u dhan, yadhunnuna billahi ghayra al-haq. Dhanna al-jahiliyya. These thoughts come from, from a person who's not Muslim, a person who's, who has no relation to Islam, because they were hypocrites. Dhanna al-jahiliyya. Yaquluna, they say, لَوْ كَانَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ مَا قُتِلْنَا هُنَا They say, if we had choice, we wouldn't have been killed here. That's the same exact statement of that uh, hypocrite, Mut'ib ibn Qushayr, who was overheard by Zubair ibn al-Awwam. So Zubair ibn al-Awwam, when he heard that verse, he remembered that person, and he remembered his statement. But what does Allah say at the end of the verse? قُلْ لَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي مَضَاجِئِ يَقُولُونَ لَوْ كَانَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ مَا قُتِلْنَا هَا هُنَا So they were complaining about the Prophet ﷺ having forced them. They, this is what they claim. قُلْ لَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي مَضَاجِئِكُمْ لَبَرَزَ الَّذِينَ كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ قُلْ لَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ لَبَرَزَ الَّذِينَ كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ قَتْلُ إِنَا مَضَاجِمَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically the gist of the end of the verse says that if Allah wrote for someone to be killed, they would be killed even if they were at home, even if, we're, if they were in their beds. So this was generally the case of the Muslims after the, uh, just after the, the main battle of Uhud. As to the ones who left the battlefield, who just ran away from the battle, because once they heard that the Prophet ﷺ had been killed, they lost all hope. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to them a verse, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَلَّوا which is the following verse, the verse number 155 from Surah Ali Imran. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَلَّوا مِنْكُمْ يَوْمَ الْتَقَى الْجَمْعَانِ إِنَّمَا اسْتَزَلَّهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ بِبَعْضِ مَا كَسَبُوا وَلَقَدْ عَفَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ حَلِيمٌ Those who uh, turned away on their heels, turned back on their heels when the two armies met, which was the, the battle of Uhud, uh, actually, shaitan caused them to slip because of their previous sins. And Allah has forgiven them. Allah has forgiven them. So this was glad tiding to those people because they, were, they fell down after they heard the Prophet ﷺ had been killed. They lost all hope. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ and some Muslim they had some water. They drank some of the water. And then the two armies were totally separated. The uh, army of the Mushrikeen went back to their camp. The Muslims were on one side of the mountain of Uhud. Yet, during the Battle of Badr, there was a very strong fighter in the Muslim camp. He was really giving hard time to the non-Muslims. He killed so many among them. And the Muslims actually were impressed. Most of the Muslims actually, to the extent that they mentioned... Him to the Prophet ﷺ. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, there is one person, one of the Muslims, one of our army, who was so powerful, he gave hard time to the non-Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, show him to me. They showed him. He, that's, that's the person, that's the fighter. The Prophet ﷺ looked at him. What's his name? They told him his name, he didn't recognize him. They described him, he didn't recognize him. The Prophet ﷺ looked at him and he said, that fighter is from the people of the hellfire. The Muslims were shocked, were totally shocked. If that person is from the people of the hellfire, who is going to, from among us, who's going to be from the people of paradise? He's the best fighter today. He was the best fighter among the Muslims today. The Prophet, ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said, he is from the people of the hellfire. 
One of the companions said, there must be a secret behind that. I will follow him. He followed him through the battle. And then, at the end of the battle, he came to the Prophet ﷺ, this young man, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, I bear witness that you are the Messenger of Allah. So they asked him what had happened. He said, I followed that person. Because I was shocked when the Prophet ﷺ said that he will be from the people of the hellfire. But he was on our camp. He was fighting the non-Muslims. He said, I followed him. And during the battle, he was wounded. And his wound started to hurt him. He felt the pain of it. He couldn't put up with the pain. So what he did, he put his sword on his chest or on his stomach. And he leaned or he put the... A handle of his sword on the ground, then he leaned on his sword and caused it to penetrate his body. So it came out of his back. So he killed himself. So this guy rushed to the Muslims and to the Prophet ﷺ to just give them that news, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you have told the truth. And it turned out that this person was actually fighting for the sake of the pride of his tribe. Or his uh, one, one, one side of the tribe of his own tribe. And the Prophet ﷺ then said, a person of you, he does the deeds of the, uh, of the people of paradise, he does uh, the deeds of the people of the paradise, until in what appears to be the case. Seemingly he does the actions of the people of paradise, uh, until there is only about one hand span between him and paradise. Then, all of a sudden he does something that's from the actions of the people of the hellfire and he goes and enters the hellfire. And a person does, seemingly, he's evil. He does so many bad things that until he's about to enter the hellfire, then he does righteous deeds of those of the people of paradise and he enters paradise. We have actually in the battle of Uhud an example. This, this fighter who killed himself Seemingly he was from the people of paradise, but because he, his actions were not sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were for another purpose. He ended up doing something that will take him to the hellfire. And if you remember the story of uh, Amr ibn Aqiyash, uh, the person who used to deal with usury and riba, when he heard that the Muslims went out, and he had been a non-Muslim at that time, then he came and joined the Muslims and he said, I've believed, he actually believed at that time. And he fought with the Muslims, he entered paradise without having prayed any rak'ah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he entered paradise. That's another example of a person who seemed to be going to the hellfire, but actually he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he believed and he will be admit, admitted to paradise. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on one side of the Mount of Uhud, uh, he wanted to mount on a huge rock in order to overlook the battlefield and just see what happened. Because, of, because he was exhausted, he was extremely tired, he was drained. He tried to mount the rock, he couldn't. So Talha uh, ibn Ubaidullah, uh, despite his fingers being cut, his hand being paralyzed, he saw the Prophet ﷺ trying to mount that rock and he couldn't. He kneeled down and let the Prophet ﷺ step on his back and then uh, mount that rock. When the Prophet ﷺ saw that, he said, Awjaba Talha. He said, Talha has made something that has given him a guarantee of paradise. From Allah. Because he has done so much sacrifice today. He has fought so bravely today to the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteed uh, paradise for him. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, washed his face with some water. Then Fatima came to him and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Fatima started to wash the wounds of the, 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 wounds of the Prophet ﷺ. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was pouring the water to help her. And she noticed that the more water they poured on the wounds of the Prophet ﷺ, the more blood was coming out. So Fatima took some, uh, a piece from a straw mat. She burnt it. It became so dry and she put it on the wounds of the Prophet ﷺ and then the blood stopped. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ was so concerned about Hamza and he started asking the companions, did anyone see where the body, because he received the news about Hamza, 
being killed and that made the Prophet ﷺ very sad. Hamza had a, very, had a very special place in the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, he asked, the Prophet ﷺ asked, did anyone see where the body of Hamza was? One of the Muslims said, yes, O Messenger Allah, I've seen that. The Prophet ﷺ said, take me to that. Take me to that place. I want to see Hamza. So the man walked and the Prophet ﷺ and some of the companions followed that man to go and see the body of Hamza. But just before that, when the Prophet ﷺ was still on one side of the mount of Mount Uhud, Abu Sufyan came and he disturbed the silence. What did Abu Sufyan do? What did he say? What, what was the reply of the Muslims? These are things that we will try to highlight after this short break. Stay tuned. Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Brothers and sisters, to increase your iman. من تعلم القرآن وعلمه ورتل القرآن ترتيلا Learning how to recite the Quran properly Learning the meaning of what we recite Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life we Would listen to the participants and the guests We'll take your phone calls We're going to recite life We'll listen to your recitation and will correct it according to the rules and regulations which will state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. <laughs> Is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. It's towards the end of the Battle of Uhud. The two camps have separated. The Mushrikeen went back to their camp. The Muslims were on one side of the mountain of Uhud. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ asked about Hamza and he wanted to see his body. And one of the Muslims had seen the body of Hamza so he knew where it was. But yet at that moment, or just around it, Abu Sufyan came and he realized there were some Muslims there on the mountain. So he came saying, or making a very uh, provoking statement, he said, Hubal. Hubal is one of their gods, one of their idols, one of their statues. He said, may Hubal be the highest, with all arrogance. The Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, don't answer him, let him. So then Abu Sufyan asked, is among you Muhammad? Because he was hoping that Muhammad ﷺ was killed. The Prophet ﷺ saw, uh, told the, uh, the companions, don't respond, leave him. Just don't give him any attention. Is among you Muhammad? Three times. Is among you Muhammad? They didn't respond. Is among you the son of Abu Quhafa? He means Abu Bakr. Is among you Abu Bakr? Three times. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't respond. For the third time, Abu Sufyan asked, Is among you Umar ibn al-Khattab? The Prophet ﷺ told them, don't respond. Is among you Umar ibn al-Khattab? Three times. They didn't respond. Then Abu Sufyan said, if these people are dead and killed, then that's enough for us. We've made it. We've taken, uh, we've avenged our, our beloved ones, our loved ones. Umar ibn Khattab could not hold himself. He went out of control and he said, these three people you've asked about are still alive and they will only remain for you that which will hurt you. When that was the case, Abu Sufyan felt a bit frustrated, so he tried to provoke the Muslims more. His hopes diminished, because he hoped that these three people were killed. So he said, U'lu Hubal. He said, our God Hubal is above yours. 
The Prophet ﷺ told the companions, why don't you respond to him? They said, what shall we say? He said, say to the, say, uh, he said to them, tell him or reply by saying, Allahu a'la wa ajal. Allah is much higher. Allah is much greater than your false idol. He said, u'luhu bal. The Muslims responded, Allahu a'la wa ajal. Abu Sufyan said, Lana al-uzza wa la uzza lakum. Abu Sufyan said that we have a God called Al-Uzza, which gives us victory, but you don't have a similar God. The Prophet to instructed the companions to respond, say to him, Allahu mawlana wa la mawla lakum. Allah is our ally, Allah is our helper, our assistant. Allah will take care of us, and you have nobody to take care of you, because your God is false. It's a piece of stone, or a piece of wood, or a piece of metal. This, this is the whole story. So uh, Abu Sufyan as well tried to provoke the Muslims. He, every time he tried to provoke the Muslims, he was getting a silencing answer, very strong answer from the companions. May Allah be pleased with them, based on the instructions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then he said that we have killed so many among you and we have won the battle. The Umar ibn Khattab responded to him, he said, we are not equal. Abu Sufyan reminded the companions of the battle of Badr. He said to them, يَوْمٌ بِيَوْمِ Badr." That's a day, a revenge, this day is a revenge for the day of Badr. And the ones that are killed from your people, they are in return. Or we have avenged now our loved ones who were killed, whom you killed in the battle of Badr. Umar ibn Khattab responded to him, we are not equal. It's not the same. Because your murdered ones, the ones who were killed from among you in Badr, they will be in the hellfire. But our murdered ones will be in paradise. He said, La sawa qatlana fil jannah wa qatlakum fil nar. All honor. Feeling the honor of Islam, the dignity of Islam. At this hard time, now when Muslims have an attitude, an apologetic view, uh, apologetic attitude. When Muslims have an inferiority complex, the Muslims at that time, at the time when they were hit by that tragedy, they still feel the pride of Islam, the dignity and the honor of Islam. They never feel inferior to people who worship things other than Allah, people who don't give Allah His rights. They said, لا سواء قتلانا في الجنة وقتلاكم في النار. They see the truth about this life, even if you don't have the power, even if you don't have the technology, even if you uh, have been subdued, have been overcome by your enemy, you realize that we have the truth, and we hold on to the truth, and that gives us a position higher than what you believe in. So then Abu Sufyan concluded by saying, some of our people have mutilated the bodies of your dead ones. I did not request for that to be done. I did not give any command that bodies should be mutilated. But yet still, and this shows the, 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 the hatred they have towards the, Muslim, to, towards the Muslims. He said, but we didn't actually object to that. We didn't order that to happen. And, but still yet, we didn't have an objection to that. And that was what, was, what, uh, what happened. Actually, one of the mushrikeen said, uh, if Muhammad, out of arrogance, he said, if Muhammad is upon the truth, you know, because as they had this, in the heat of the moment, they had this pride of victory, he said, if Muhammad is upon the truth, may the earth split and swallow me. At that very moment, the earth split and swallowed him and he was into it. Now some of the people of the mushriks must have asked themselves, if Muhammad is really a messenger from God, from Allah, why didn't Allah give him victory? Why didn't Allah just support him and let him overcome everybody and spread the message? But there is a beautiful lesson behind that. There's a very important lesson behind that, that the Prophet ﷺ was sent as a messenger to be an example 
to all the Muslims who will come behind, that you will have to pay the price. You will have to sacrifice. You will have to go through ups and downs. And the Prophet ﷺ is a human being. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supports him at all times with miracles, the Prophet ﷺ one day will pass away. And miracles will not give rise to a nation that will spread the message of Allah. No, it has to be human sacrifice. Muslims have to deal with the real world. It's not about superstition. It's not about uh, just asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us without us doing what we should do. So here there is a lesson that the Muslims will have to, uh, will have to pay the price for the mistakes that they fall into and for, the, for the, th- the wrong things that they do. So there is a great lesson. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he did after the battle, he went to see the body of Hamza. And when he saw Hamza cut in that way and mutilated in that way, he felt really bad about that. And he said to the companions, I really wanted to leave Hamza as he is, so that the beasts come and eat his body. So on the day of judgment, he will be resurrected from their stomachs. But I'm afraid that Safiya, Safiya, the sister of Hamza, who's the aunt as well of the Prophet ﷺ, she's the mother of Az, uh, Zubair ibn al-Awwam. Uh, and uh, because I'm afraid that Safiya will find it difficult and will find it humiliating to leave her brother Hamza to be eaten by the beasts, I would have really left him so the beasts eat him and he would be resurrected uh, from their uh, stomachs. Now when they, uh, later on the Prophet ﷺ wanted to bury uh, his companions, but just before that, and listen to this wonderful example. Imagine after this tra- tragedy, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He said to his companions, stand up in rows. Stand up in lines. I want to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine after that tragedy, people tend to complain. People tend to feel that, why did this happen to me? The Prophet sallallahu said to the companions, اصطفوا حتى أثني على ربي. Stand in rows and lines, because I want to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu stood he raised his hands up and he made a wonderful supplication. He said, Oh Allah, no one has control over the universe except you. No one can give what you have withheld and no one can withhold whatever you've given. No one can change what you have decreed and no one can decree whatever you have decided not to happen. So beautiful words about the mercy of Allah, about the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that everything is within the command of Allah. Then he said, O oh Allah, zayyinna bi zinat al-iman. Allah, make us true believers. O oh Allah, beautify iman to our hearts. O oh Allah, keep us upon the straight path. O oh Allah, you deserve all praise. O oh Allah, give us victory. O oh Allah, destroy the enemies of Islam. Imagine at that moment, after that great loss, the Prophet ﷺ praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Muslims, their souls were relieved, were at ease and at happiness and contentment with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the example that we should follow. But what did the Prophet ﷺ and his companions do right after that? Join us next time, inshaAllah, so that we know what happened and how the Muslims carried themselves after this great loss. Until then, Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but He knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter. And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that 
everything's going wrong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. And the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong